Rose Mackenberg was practically Nancy Drew, a plucky investigator in New York City. Early in life, she had believed that psychics and fortune tellers really were able to communicate with spirits and foretell the future. In the early 1920s, the Spanish flu pandemic and World War I had resulted in so many sudden deaths that many grieving people turned to spiritualism, the belief that the spirits of the dead have both the ability and the inclination to communicate with the living, the bereaved hoping that they might have just one last moment with their lost loved ones. Looking back in history, the Civil War prompted Lincoln to hold seances in the White House. The Second World War ushered in another revival of spiritualism, and it happened again during the Korean War. Mackenberg was working on a case involving, wouldn't you just know it, money, lots of it. Certain investments had been recommended by a psychic medium who then funneled the money to her partner. Mackenberg consulted Houdini on the case because he was very publicly engaged in a campaign against false spirit mediums. Houdini was impressed with her and educated her on the tricks that mediums use to manipulate their victims. In 1925, Houdini invited Rose to join his team of about 20 salaried undercover investigators. He referred to them as my own secret service. The team included several other women beside Mackenberg, including Houdini's niece, Julia Sawyer. While Houdini was on tour in 1925 and 26, Mackenberg and the other investigators would precede him by several days into each city and perform undercover investigations of the most prominent local spiritualists or psychic mediums. Then, when Houdini later performed in each city, he would debunk local mediums from the stage, presenting the gathered evidence. Eventually, Mackenberg became Houdini's chief investigator. She claimed to have investigated over 1,000 mediums and never found one who was not a fraud. This kind of deceptive activism has a long tradition in magic. Maskeline, Houdini, and Dunninger all infiltrated seances to reveal fraudulent mediums, and today Randy is known for exposing very sloppy methodology in the parapsychology lab. Houdini stated in 1924, I am not a skeptic. I am willing to believe, and my mind is wide open, but in 35 years, I've never met a medium who could convert me. A precursor to Randy's Million Dollar Challenge, Houdini had publicized a prize of $10,000, almost $140,000 in today's money, that he would give to anyone who could convincingly prove before a distinguished jury that they could contact spirits from the beyond. The prize was, of course, never claimed. More recently, Darren Brown has presented television specials where the paranormal is very seductively evoked, but then clearly revealed to be just a trick. All of these stage magicians have shared a moral mission to educate the public about the misuse of trickery by those claiming to be channeling special powers. Generally, the audience is vital in making the magic happen. They want to believe the impossible. For example, the various mediums had claimed to communicate with over three dozen of Mackenberg's deceased husbands, all fictional. She never married. In 1926, an anti-fortune-telling law for Washington, D.C. was proposed on the urging of Houdini. House committee hearings were held, and Houdini was set to testify in the law's favor. Mackenberg visited local Washington mediums in the days prior to the hearings, targeting local mediums who were scheduled to testify against the bill. In her testimony, she named four senators who one medium said had come to her for readings. 
She also revealed that table-tipping seances were held at the White House with President Coolidge and his family. This was met with raucous denials in the committee room, and a fracas ensued. The meeting was adjourned. President Coolidge did not officially respond to the accusation, but unofficial denials were made known in the press. Ultimately, the bill did not pass, but the hearings received wide press coverage. After Houdini's death in October 1926, Mackenberg continued to investigate fraudulent psychics for over 20 years and serve as an expert witness on them in various venues. One such court case in Pennsylvania involved a will bequeathing a large sum of money to a spiritualistic college to educate mediums at Lilydale, New York, still a famous camp and meeting place for spiritualists. The state of Pennsylvania sought to invalidate the will because the bequest would benefit criminal behavior and thus would be against public policy. Mackenberg was called as an expert witness and the state was successful at trial. In addition to her investigations, Mackenberg attempted to educate the public. She toured the country giving lectures on psychic fraud to various groups. A typical talk title was Debunking the Ghost Racket. These talks would include demonstrations of techniques used by psychics, including spirit trumpets, table tipping, billet reading, and the like. Mackenberg died in 1968. She had said, I do not impugn spiritualism as a sect or as a sincere religious belief. There are many intellectually honest persons, some mediums included, who get solace from a belief in contacts with the afterworld. There are 15 or so spiritualist camps around the country, including Lilydale in New York and Casadaga in Florida. I am a retired chiropractor for the STARS from Los Angeles. I'm also an ordained minister since 1972. I'm also the co-pastor of Colby Memorial Temple. I have before me a picture of all of your guides and teachers. When you came into this earth plane, you came in with guardian angels. You also came in with several different teachers. You have a master teacher, a chemical doctor, an Indian guide, a material doctor, some sort of a religious person, a nurse, and a little doorkeeper. I call her my doorkeeper. My little doorkeeper's name is Yellow Rose. She'll be the first one who greets you today. Now it takes me a few minutes to come into your rate of vibration and that, so let's just take a moment. My facial features may change, my voice may change, okay? Good morning, Miss Mary. My name is Yellow Rose. I'm eight years old. How are you? Give me a goddamn break. I don't want to rush to judgment, but really. Both practitioners and seekers seem to display a determined credulity. This credulity is born of intense longing for something beyond themselves, for a mystical someone to protect and take care of them, and who doesn't dream of that kind of grace? I lost my partner on the night that we were going to be engaged. It was September of 07. And he called me um, to say he just wanted to finish one errand on the farm and then he'd be in to pick me up. And he didn't show up. Um, so I called him, but uh, he didn't answer. So a couple of his friends rode out and found him out in the field. Nobody knows for sure what happened. I have a lady in spirit who's not talking about who she is. She says it's not important who she is, as much as that you understand that there are periods in your life where you are being wrapped with gentle arms. And she says, we're the people who come and wrap people in gentle arms. Do you understand that? She is talking about how you have been asking for information, or you've been asking why. And as you've been asking why, you're finding nothing but the most deafening silence. He loves me. All right? So I leave that for you with God's blessings. Thank, Thank you. you.
Should spiritualism be dignified with the term religion? Its premise is impossible to prove or disprove. Without a single shred of evidence, I'm not going to cast my religious lot with any of the claimants, especially when purported phenomena are so easy for even a bad magician to simulate. Many practitioners try way too hard to convince vulnerable people who have already done 90% of the work of convincing themselves. This is giving one of you chills in the back, kind of freaking you out because you don't know if you really believe in this or not. Don't try to understand it, just, just accept it. This brings up so many questions. Am I free to evaluate what seem to me clear facts? Am I truly unbiased? I've weighed holding back versus going ahead and judging, and since I have this platform, I can at least float the various conclusions. Is it right for me to revile a religion that fills a need so deep in people who are deeply hurting, desperately hungering for reassurance? And these people, can I fault them for not being so strong as I perhaps foolishly claim to be myself? Even the Bible gives specific and I think wise advice, raising a red flag in Matthew 7.15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The vulnerability of heartfelt grief is easy for the wolves to spot. Those who style themselves as spirit mediums can and do simply lie without fear of discovery. Why would anyone do that? The answer is almost always money. Once in a while it's sex or power or validation, but usually it's money. No matter how sincerely people hold their religious beliefs, it's clearly high time to retire empty validation for what's clearly not there at all in any form. You have to condemn a religion that lends itself so strongly to abuse and to the victimization of people when they're at their most vulnerable. That upsets and disgusts me every time I hear it, because cynical or sincere, Fooling others or fooling yourself, that kind of falsity is pathologically cruel. Are you a fan of the sideshow carnival and burlesque? Have I got a show for you! Stop! Look through the doorway! They're looking at Grace McDaniels, the mule-faced girl, Priscilla, the bearded lady, Emmett, the elephant skin man, a whole presentation of freaks, real people, the strangest people on earth, born to live. Ballycast presents news and interviews with performers and showmen, the kind of people you won't believe. Both swallowing swords while they're resting on the bed of nails on their stomach, and they've got their legs coming around and they're grabbing them, and the swords are on fire, and then myself and Brianna Belladonna spit fire off the swords. A look behind the scenes where the average Joe never dares to go. We've got their attention, we've got their money, and we've got them in a seat, so they're strapped in to take the ride that we're going to take them on. Responsible information about exciting new acts. <laughs> I was hurt, I just didn't bother to notice. Well, that's why they put young and stupid in the same category. Wholesome entertainment for young and old. Oh, isn't it wonderful? You just called me a big festering <laughs> bag of puffs. Isn't it simply wonderful? Ballycast is not family friendly. I'm not even thinking about it. So listen at your own risk. What do you say when somebody goes, that was that was simply disgusting. You all are, should be ashamed of yourselves. Thanks for your money. <laughs> we have some incredible performers in New York. So you get women who were made fun of their whole life because they were flat chested. You get women who were made fun of because they were overweight. And they all get on stage. And one is not a bigger movie star than the other. They're all just giant stars. Once I've got the toilet plunger down my throat, then I pull out a two foot measuring stick. And I shove it down my throat and I get it down to the top edge of the stomach. And everybody thinks I'm done. And then I push it the rest of the way and they all go <gasps> 
so much fun to do. You'll discover a new world, meet new friends, see plenty of things you've never seen before, things you'll remember all your life, and some you may want to forget. How many times can you stick a hook in yourself and not be walking around full of holes? About once every other week. Ballycast is available free on iTunes or directly from Ballycast.com. Brought to you by Blue Ridge Entertainment. Thanks for riding. Please exit to your left.